Hello, I'm Corinna Howard and this is the Monday Night Review. Hello and welcome to episode 112 of the Monday Night Review. Hope you are well. I am in my office. I thought I'd have internet by now. I do not have internet. I have the cable I need for internet, but no internet yet. But I am watching my husband dig in the pond that I requested for my 40th birthday. It's slightly in the wrong place, but that's fine. It's the, the, uh, all weekend, he's been digging this pond in, surrounding it with sand. It's been really rainy. And what I didn't realise when I was asking for a pond for my 40th was it is a, it is a labour of love. <laughs> if I ever doubted his love for me, which I never have, he is showing it to me now. He was out there in the torrential rain yesterday getting it sorted. It's had about 12 plus bags of sand in there around the edges. He's now filling it up. He's then going to drain it. There's lots going on. And I'm here in the warm thinking about spooky stuff, which is where I'd like to be. I mean, once this office gets internet, I may never leave it, especially during the half term. My goddaughter turned 18 yesterday, which is a pretty big deal. 18-year-old goddaughter does make me feel old. Very weird. Luckily, I also have a five-month-old goddaughter, so that's, you know, I'm, I've, got them, I've got them lined up. <laughs> Thanks for all your feedback about the recent episodes. I really love your messages. Um, they, I cannot tell you how much uh, receiving an email or a message from you guys. It's just such a joy. And yeah, if you're not someone who usually tells the podcasts or the YouTubers or the people online that you like them or why you like them, do it. it makes us happy. So today's sources are <laughs> quite a few academic papers. Don't want to blow my own trumpet, but. I'm up there reading the academic papers, looking like a spod. But also ghosttheory.com, Astonishing Legends podcast website, Wikipedia. There's loads of random little snippets. There's quite a lot in German. And although I love you, I don't love you enough to translate everything from German into English. And I don't know a word of it. So today we're going to be talking about the Rosenheim poltergeist. In the late 1960s, Rosenheim was a relatively small town located in the state of Bavaria in southern Germany. It had a population of around 30,000 people and the town's economy was based on various industries, including manufacturing, agriculture and trade. Though you may not have heard of it, Rosenheim would become very well known for one thing in particular, the Rosenheim pol poltergeist, which refers to a series of unexplained disturbances and stands as one of the most perplexing and well-documented poltergeist cases. The events of the Rosenheim poltergeist unfolded between 1967 and 1968, captivating the attention of local res researchers and sceptics alike. The disturbances primarily centred around the office of a lawyer named Sigmund Adam in Rosenheim. Uh, the paranormal occurrences included unexplained knocking sounds, furniture moving on its own, and inexplicable fluctuations in the brightness of electric lights. It all began when the office started receiving strange phone calls. Whenever somebody answered, there would be no one on the other end. Weird and maybe annoying, but not necessarily spooky. But this would then happen on all four of the office phone lines, and sometimes repeatedly. The phones were replaced, but it continued to happen with the new ones. Anna became understandably frustrated and called the phone company, who checked they can find no reason for these calls. Frustration grew, and when the phone bill came in, it showed charges for repeated calls to 0119, the talking clock. Youngsters will not know about this, but before the internet, if you wanted the exact time, you had to call a number on your phone. Often that phone would be attached to a wall, just saying, and that would tell you the exact time. The phone company registered six calls per minute, sometimes, to this talking clock. This was actually a physical impossibility, given that the office at the time 
had rotary phones. Again, youngsters, these are the ones where you put your finger in a hole corresponding to the number and you have to twist it all the way around. So you then had to wait for it to go back round before you chose the next number. And the payment for that call wouldn't click in until the phone was answered. So they're saying that they are making six of these calls per minute, but you can't dial 0119 and have it on long enough to connect that many times in a minute. It's just a physical impossibility. The phone company, a bit like Hail for Nog with the electricity problem, the phone company were like, well, that's what's registering. And Sigmund Adam is saying, not only did this not happen, but it's a physical impossibility. And they, they kind of go backwards and forwards about it an awful lot. The stranger was yet to come. In October, the lights started flashing on and off. The fixtures that the lights were in would rotate and swing and sometimes light bulbs would explode. These included the long tube light bulbs. So Adam calls the electricity company to see if there's a fault somewhere. An electrician comes in, he checks everything out and finds no fault and no reason for the weird goings on. He installs volt voltage meters to check for power surges and the results show surges so powerful that they should have completely blown the fuses in the whole building and yet the fuses aren't being blown it's literally just f flickering lights and exploding light bulbs when the photocopier starts to leak ink for no reason they switch all the power off to the office and Adam buys a private generator that he hooks all the office machinery up to because he's convinced that the fault lies with the electric company. And yet the problems persist. The calls and the complaints between Adam and the phone line company and the electric company are going backwards and forwards and more people begin to hear of the strange goings on. And eventually two physicists from the Max Planck Institute offered to come and see the office and carry out an investigation. They detected no abnormal electromagnetic readings and their conclusion was that something was happening beyond their knowledge and experience. An unknown form of energy was at work. During the winter of 1967-1968, the phenomena escalated. Calendar pages would rip from the wall, drawers would open and close, and huge pieces of furniture, including a library bookcase weighing more than 180 kilos, would move across the floor, leaving no marks or scratches on the linoleum underneath. And this happened whilst people were watching. All of this is taking place. It's not a case of, oh, I went home and I know I switched all the lights off and when I come back, the lights are on. People are sitting at their desks, the phones are going bonkers, the calendar's going mad, lights are flickering and smashing. It's all, there's loads of witnesses for this. By now, news has reached paranormal circles and Hans Bender of Freeburg's Institute for Parapsychological Research contacted Adam and offered to come in and conduct an investigation. And Adam's, at this point, the more the merrier, he just wants it all to stop. You can imagine, he's German, he's efficient, it's the 60s, he just wants to get on with his work, all of this is going on. Part of his investigation involved interviewing all the employees, I'm not sure how much of this was done before, and he realises that the phenomena takes place at certain times of day, and these coincide with the work schedule of one employee, Anne-Marie Scarbell. Amory was just 19 and had worked in the office for about two years as an administrative assistant. It was actually Hans Bender's young assistant who was the first to notice that the phenomena seemed to start and stop when she was in the office. And she was given a leave of absence to attend the institute with Bender, who could then talk to her and discover what was going on. And he would discover that she hated her work, disliked her colleagues. And though she was engaged at the time, she seemed to be in great emotional turmoil. And this was, is exactly the sort of person 
that a, a paranormal researcher or a psychologist would expect at to be at the root of poltergeist activity a, a teenage girl going through emotional turmoil is quite often going to be present when there is poltergeist activity Bender discovered that the calls to the talking clock happened when she w- would be fixated on the clock ticking towards her home time, the time that she could leave the office. As she walked down the corridor in the office, the lights would swing backwards and forwards over her head as she passed underneath them. She had no idea that the phenomena was linked to her at all. She hadn't put two and two together and sort of thought, why is, why is this all happening when I'm here? And I guess you wouldn't. She's not really in the office by herself. But it does seem that, you know, as she moves around the office, stuff starts happening. Now, initially, Bender's tests for any kind of psychic ability don't show up anything. But as they discussed an illness she'd suffered a, a few years prior, the results began to change. Amory had spent a year in plaster with a tubercular hip, which I'm not sure that's a thing. Is it? Tubercular hip. Anyway, she was in plaster in bed for a year. And as they talked about it, she became deeply disturbed. And then she started to show remarkable telepathic abilities. Having had no problems whilst Amory was at the Institute, as soon as she returned to the office, the electrical problems began again. In January 1968, she quit working for the solicitor's firm, though in some versions we have it that she's let go when she gets back and all this stuff starts up again. Either way, she leaves. And when she starts her new job, the phenomena follows her there. When her fiancé breaks up with her in a bowling alley, the school board apparently started to malfunction. I've read another version of this that has it that her fiancé took her bowling to the Catholic Youth Club And while they were there, the electronic scoreboard and pin setter started to go bonkers and he called it off. He had worked out that all of this weird stuff was associated with her and he had tapped out. Either or, I mean, if she is the root of this phenomena, she's clearly unhappy and therefore I think it's the bullet dodged. I've even seen a story of her working at a mill and a colleague dying in an accident caused by a mechanical failure and basically everyone attributing it to her, whether it was her or not. She got married in 1969, had three kids and all poltergeist activity surrounding her stopped. But what went on? with the Rosenheim poltergeist. Some attributed the occurrences to psychokinesis, the alleged ability of an individual to influence matter or energy with their mind, a bit like Matilda. They speculated that Amory might possess latent psychokinetic abilities, unknowingly triggering the disturbances through emotional or psychological stress. Others postulated that the phenomena were caused by a form of unconscious telekinesis, where the subconscious mind of the individual involved interacts with the environment in ways they're not consciously aware of. This theory attempted to explain how the events seemed to revolve around Anne-Marie without her intention or conscious control. Skeptics, on the other hand, argued that the Rosenheim poltergeist could be explained by natural causes or even deliberate hoaxes. Two journalists wrote a piece claiming that they'd gone into the office and found nylon threads and evidence of tampering and all of that. But there's, A, no evidence of them ever having visited the office. But also, and the, and the witnesses, the, the office workers all said that they, they never came. They never came in to see the office. Though some pointed out potential flaws in the investigations and questioned the reliability of eyewitness accounts, there were not only a lot of eyewitnesses, but it seems hard to know what the benefit of this hoax would be. No one's particularly out there looking for a haunted solicitor. Staff were unhappy and disturbed. One woman lost her job. You know, Amory lost her job or quit. 
there's no, I cannot see, you know, you can say, oh, it's for publicity. It's not getting them work. It's not a big town. How many solicitors are there going to be? There's no evidence that he was struggling with his business. And while scepticism is an essential aspect of scientific inquiry, it could not entirely negate the testimonies of those who witnesses the occurrences firsthand. The Rosenheim poltergeist remains one of the most intriguing and debated paranormal cases in history, not least because numerous experts and technicians from companies, including Deutsche Post, Siemens and the Max Planck Institute, were present and witnessed the phenomena and were unable to find reason for it. Despite the passage of time, its legacy endures in the world of parapsychology, influencing further research into unexplained phenomena. The case has inspired countless discussions, books, documentaries and movies, making it a cultural touchstone for the unexplained and the supernatural. Even though the phenomena eventually ceased, the case left an indelible mark on those who experienced it, leaving them with a sense of awe and uncertainty about the limits of human understanding. The Rosenheim Poltergeist stands as a mysterious and enduring enigma, challenging our perception of reality and the limits of human consciousness. Whether a case of psychokinesis, unconscious telekinesis, or merely a result of natural causes and hoaxes, it remains an unresolved mystery. It reminds us that there are aspects of the universe that lie beyond the realm of our understanding, urging us to remain open-minded to the possibility of the unknown. As long as there are unexplained phenomena, the search for answers and the explanation of the uncharted will persist. The uncharted will persist, driving human curiosity and the quest for knowledge. One thing that I think really stands out for the case of the poltergeist in this is those phone calls. Because even if everything was a hoax, despite the fact that there were lots of witnesses and there were lots of witnesses from different spheres and there were lots of expert witnesses, you know, the, the physicists would have loved to have found a reason for everything going on, I think. is those phone calls to the talking clock, which you physically, I mean, even talking about it brings back, do you remember trying to phone your boyfriend on a dial phone? I mean, I bloody love a dial phone. Trying to phone your boyfriend, you get to the second to last number and you do it wrong. You've got to start all over again. So not only has the person, you, you know, this is someone dialing just six times a minute. You struggle to do that on a normal button phone, obviously without the redial function. But for me, that's the thing. You could maybe work out some electrical person could set up something to cause surges and you could move stuff with strings. Although I don't see how you could move something that weighs 180 kilos with some nylon string. But those phone calls, they can't, there's no answer for them. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Felt like we needed something a little bit spooky. And it wasn't actually one I'd heard of before. And I want to do a whole episode on Poltergeist because I think I, I do think it's a very interesting. It's almost for me where um, paranormal meets science. I know that paranormal science is a thing. But do you know what I mean? Where these things happen and we attribute it to something paranormal, but it is always usually it is usually linked to a young person a child or a young girl who's going through emotional turmoil and I find that very interesting do let me know if your requests and recommendations and I love to hear from you so send me an email the Monday night review at gmail.com you can find us on social media at the Monday night review and you can come and join the Patreon who missed out on an extra episode last week because my children but maybe one time you're going to get two in a week so don't think I'm going to let let you down on that front 
And until next time, be kind, stay safe, and always check the back seat before you drive.